Hey, Vanessa, welcome to the Love Drive podcast. Thanks, John. Yeah, do you want to take a second to introduce yourself? Yeah, so much pressure. <laughs> I'm used to introducing myself. Uh, my name is Vanessa Bennett. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in California. Uh, I am an author. I have a new book coming out soon. I am what I like to call a codepen- codependency expert. I hate the word expert, but it's mostly just because it's an obsession of mine. and something I talk about nonstop. Um, I what else am I? I'm a content creator. I consider myself a holistic psychotherapist because I look at all the things. Um, and my background's in depth psychology, so the psychology of the soul, um, as what? one might Whoa. call it, or as the Jungians call it. That's cool. Yeah. And you're a new mom. I am a newish mom. She's two and a half, so that I guess that's still considered new mom. I guess newish mom. And you're an author of a new book that's coming out. It's not me. It's you. Mm-hmm. Relationship book coming out in September. Yeah. Yeah. Co-authored with uh, John Kim. My baby daddy, John Kim. Your baby daddy, not your husband. Not my husband. No, my baby daddy <laughs> slash roommate, as you called him earlier, slash, uh, <laughs> you know, partner. I like to call him partner. L- lover. Lover. Also a therapist. So people also are always like, oh God, what's that like in a relationship? <laughs> I, well, I, I, I am curious. What What is that like? What? Yeah. It's not what people think, which is usually like, are you guys just psychoanalyzing each other all the time? Uh, no, I would say 90% of the time we just exist in our unconscious bubble, egoic place of being, right? Which all of us do. Uh, but what I do find very refreshing about this relationship is that the person speaks the language, has the self-awareness to not be defensive or at least catch themselves when they are being defensive. Um, and just as willing to like dig in and, and really like roll up their sleeves, which is the first time I've ever experienced that personally in a relationship. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, uh, you know, someone who can repair, yes. who can pause and see, oh, okay, what, what are the underlying issues here? What are the stories we're telling ourselves? What are the patterns that we might be, you know, that might be coming up in this, in this conflict or this fight or this argument? Yeah. Uh, you asked I mean, me what I, it, Sorry, go ahead. No, No, I was just going to say, I think people ask me, you know, it, it, it's, I think in order to be in this field, and I would say probably the same for you, you do have to be a little obsessed with like the human condition, like how people work and why, and just have that kind of nature of constantly wanting to learn and dig. And, and so it's, it's nice to share that I think with your partner. Yeah. Yeah, you uh, you and Danae asked me when I was on your podcast last week what it's you know what it's like dating a love coach or or you know how has that affected my dating life and people ask that of me often they want to know you know is it amazing it must be so amazing you know and the reality yeah. is I'm just like a person and in my relationship I'm also just a person I'm ninety percent just a regular dude enjoying mm-hmm. life uh, and then sometimes I could bring some additional perspective or context when something is going on. I'm, and I'm a little, probably a little bit more curious. Yeah. Than I think it's people. that curiosity. I think that's the, that's the key component that feels different for me being in relationship with somebody who's like in that headspace is the curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And I don't know if you knew this, but I'm from Montreal and in Quebec, it's very common for people to just be together and not get married. I love that. Maybe I should move to Montreal. No, I wouldn't. Cause I hate the weather, but I, I like that ideal. Do you hate I'm weather from up, in general? I'm, up, I'm from upstate New York, so I know the weather that you guys get. It's the same weather that we used to get, <laughs> that I got growing up. <laughs> Minus three degrees. Uh-huh. Hate it. That's why I live in California now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can visit it in the summertime, but you also don't have to go there to, to not want to get married or, or be okay not being married. Rewrite the rules. I think that's what we're doing. I mean, it's not to say that we won't ever. We're not like anti. We just didn't feel like it was something that was... Uh, like a checklist item that we had to do, you know? Yeah. I think we're, we're really pushing against this idea of this is what it should look like because yeah. we just want to know why, like who says. <laughs> yeah. Society says, mm-hmm. Vanessa. Fuck society. Okay. Can I say fuck? <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you can. Uh, I always I had, sort of have a similar feeling about marriage. I always thought that having a kid was way more of a commitment than some ceremony Totally. You know, some paper that can, you know, be reversed at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, really reverse that. 
As I've been told, I've been told that it does change the dynamic of your relationship, that there is something about it. And and look, I mean, I, I do, I respect the importance of ritual. I think ritual is very important and a lot of ritual has been lost in our culture. Um, and, you know, how, how ritual kind of connects you to something larger than yourself. I, I value yeah. that and respect that. So I think even if we were to ever do it, it would be more around ritual than it would be around um, whatever kind of show. I think a lot mm. of weddings have become, you know, for yeah. other people. <laughs> yeah. I think having a party with your friends would be fun. That's it. That's all I want. It's celebration. You know? Cele- what did he say? He said celebration over ceremony. I think maybe it was the way he put it. Yeah. Yeah. But with ritual, which is sort of a ceremony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're so Sean, complex. Nuance. We're so we're so <laughs> complex. We're so complex. Uh, okay, so you you call yourself? I, I don't like the word expert either, but I it does have it does play a role and it it has like a place, you know? Yeah, agreed. Um, so you call yourself a codependency expert. I mean, can we just like what is codependency? Yeah, I mean, just start start with that. We'll start with the basics, right? So, I, I codependency. I'm I'm. I always say that I've been kind of personally recovering on my recovery journey since I was probably about, I don't know, 25, uh, when I first started therapy and I've also changed a lot of the way that I've thought about, spoken about, looked at codependency, even in the last like five years, my understanding of it has really just gotten broader and deeper both. Um, the way that I talk about codependency first and foremost is that everybody, and I can only speak to the Western society, right? Cause it's kind of where I come from, but we're all codependent in some way or another. Every one of us, it's the air we breathe. Um, it's, it's what we're taught love should look and feel like. So it's, it's almost impossible for somebody to say like, Oh, I don't have any codependent tendencies. I usually would call bullshit on that. It just might manifest in different behaviors. Um, but really the, the simplest way to kind of explain it is, uh, I like to say, it's like, if you're good, I'm good. If you're not good, I'm not good. Hmm that in itself, right? So like my emotional state is based on somebody else's emotional state, um, going even deeper, like my sense of self or my sense of worth is based outside of myself, right? So based in being connected to somebody else, based in how somebody else feels, based in a relationship's health, um, it's outside of self, right? So, uh, it, to me seems like there's a spectrum of Mm -hmm. what could be like healthy and, and maybe unhealthy codependency. Yeah. I mean, the word codependency, I think to me intrinsically means unhealthy. I think we've got a range of like, there's a certain amount of dependency that is totally normal and healthy because we're humans and we're social creatures and we do depend on other beings, right? Yeah. Um, co-regulation. There's all these different things that we do as beings that are imperative to our kind of emotional survival and health. I think once it starts to tip into this, like, um, I it's like, where do I end and another begins? There's like this blurring of, of emotional lines. Um, or like, I can't be my own sovereign being because I'm, I'm too, uh, affected by overwhelmed by consumed by whatever somebody else's kind of emotional state. I think that's where you start to tip into this like unhealthy codependency realm. Yeah. How do we, I mean, how do we find balance? Also, yeah. Okay. First question. How do we find balance in this, right? With giving the other person room to have their experience and then also with wanting to be there for them. Yeah. I mean, I think a little bit of it is around learning, uh, um, learning what, what soothing your own nervous system looks like. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a journey that everybody, it, it's a very individual journey that each of us has to go on because I don't think any two nervous systems are exactly alike, right? Like what tools work for me are not going to work for you. Um, and you know, I'm going to get triggered in different ways and different responses or, you know, different activities with different people. But I think a little bit of it is understanding, okay, this is when I am activated. This is when I am triggered. Um, and this is what the behavior looks like when that Mm. activation or triggering happens. So doing a lot of self investigation around how do I establish a tool kit, um, to soothe in that. And then once you feel like you're able to soothe or maybe take care of yourself to a certain extent, it's never going to be perfect or entire, you know, entirely done. Um, then you might say, okay, now I'm, I'm able to be there for somebody without getting lost without myself getting lost, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that when your nervous system is activated and you're feeling triggered and things are starting to sort of lose control and not make any sense, then it's going to be really hard for you to find that balance or and, and to do anything really in right you know with ease. I, I mean, I ask clients all the time. One of the questions I pose is always just ask yourself what the motivation for the behavior is. Because a lot of times what I'll see is people say, oh, well, I'm just really empathetic or I'm just really caring or I'm a caregiver, right? And I say, well, the thing about empathy is that if, it's, if you really get down to brass tacks and, the, and what you're doing is actually about you because yeah. you're uncomfortable with somebody being uncomfortable, you know, mm. it makes you anxious when somebody's hurting or not succeeding or whatever the thing is, um, then that's not actually about the other person. That's about you. And mm-hmm. then that's not empathy. Right. I had somebody in one of my classes call it me pathy, which I was like, Oh, I like that. (laughs) Oh, that is cute. Yeah. Yeah. Or if, um, you, you know, some people get a sense of accomplishment or validation as being the quote unquote empathetic person or the helper, right? That's a role they get. That's codependency. (laughs) That's codependency. I'll call everything like it is. I I say it's like this need to be needed. Right. But again, finding sense of self outside of self, I find my value and my worth as a human in being needed, right. that's not true value and worth as a human, right? Like the idea of being a sovereign being is that I have value and worth just by being here, just by being born, yeah. right? By being the spiritual being that I am. And if I need something outside of myself to give me that value and that worth, then that's worthy of looking into. Yeah. And the, that, the, that can be a piece of your worth, right? right? The fact that you want to be needed to a certain degree. I think we all sort of want to be needed to a certain degree, right? We want to be helpful. We want to be loving. I mean, not, there are some like bad people out there that don't want to feel needed and don't want to be loving. But for the most part, I think there's, there's a piece there that seems healthy and, and quote unquote normal. I know you don't really like the word normal. I, I don't like it either. I really buck against anything that you know, people want to label as normal or abnormal or mm-hmm. yeah, it's spectrum. Or a little it's bit all of spectrum. wanting to be needed. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, this is uh, why it's so tricky because codependency isn't like, uh, this is why it's not in the DSM. Like it's not a, a specific, here's the, you know, checklist of things that you have to check off in order to be codependent. I don't know that you'll ever actually see codependency in the DSM as like a, as like a disorder, you know, because I don't think it's that clear cut. I think, and again, also I think the reality is because we're all codependent, which in and, it's, in and of itself is an addiction. It's a form of addiction. It's a way to self-soothe anxiety, which is what substances do for people who have substance yeah. issues. Um, yeah. That would also be kind of a do- or opening of a door for people in the psychology world to be like, oh, actually, we're all addicts. You know, it just shows up right. differently. So, Right. I mean, that, that kind of makes sense to me. We, we all have That's how I talk coping mechanisms mm-hmm. that like sugar, alcohol... Um, other sex, people exercise yeah. other people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always just say, it's like my, you know, your Jack and Coke is just my people pleasing. It's doing, it's serving the yeah. same purpose. <laughs> you know, are you really. a people pleaser? I used to be, I mean, I can still be used for be. sure if I'm not like aware of it, but I think yeah. people pleasing for me, I think is broad. Cause I mean, it could be just like, I'm not, I try not to rock the boat in relationships, which means like, I won't speak my truth. Right. And I'll stew in resentment. Um, and so even that is people pleasing. And so it's, it's, you know, pleasing somebody else at the detriment of myself for sure. And that's often in codependency. It's like, it's at, at the expense of, right. You'll show up for someone at the expense of what you need or what's right for you. Yeah. And that's where resentment is such a huge component to beginning that journey of recovery with codependency is like, I tell clients, turn your resent. Basically, a lot of us have a hard time even naming big emotions, right? I mean, so many of us were kind of raised to like be able to say, oh, I'm happy, mad, glad, sad, which is what we say in psychology. It's like the four big ones. Anything other than that that's more nuanced, it's like we don't have language for, right? Um, And I always say like you might not be able to know any other uh, emotion on my like therapy emotions wheel, right? But you definitely know what resentment feels like. We all know what resentment feels like, especially people who struggle with codependency. And so I usually say, if you want to start doing this work, like turn the dial up on resentment and start to pay like zero in 
start to pay such close att- attention to resentment. And it doesn't have to be overwhelming where it's like this all consuming feeling. It could be like the tiniest little whiff of it. And the second you start to feel resentment, I mean, it's basically codependency is being triggered. It's being activated and it's, it's asking you to pay attention. Like something's not being said. Something's not being validated. You know, you're pushing, you're pushing yourself down for other people. It's, it's a really good flag actually. <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing. Cause I, there's a situation in my life right now that, that I feel a little resentful about because I haven't spoken and I know it's happening and I can mm-hmm. tell why it's happening. And I had just haven't said anything yet because I don't want to rock the boat. Cause I don't want to disappoint anybody. That's a big one, right? Not saying yep. something because you don't want to disappoint anybody. And I, you know, I, I'm pretty good at practicing what I preach. And there are still some times where I go, man, I'm, I'm really not, you know, I'm mm-hmm. really not speaking up when if anyone had asked me, you know, how would you deal with this situation? I would tell them speak up, you know, simple. It's like when I tell 90% of people just speak up, say the thing. Yeah. And saying a and thing is really anything. fucking hard <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> just is. Um, are, uh, is there, is there an obsession uh, with like being the chill guy or the cool girl? Totally. To, like, 100%. Get people to like us. Mm-hmm. I've actually, I've been, I've said those exact words sitting on my therapist couch. I mean, like years ago, I remember exactly <laughs> sitting on her couch and being like, but I'm, I'm the cool girl. I'm the cool girlfriend. I'm the cool friend. And she's like, what does that mean? And basically yeah. it means I have no needs. Right. Yeah. I am needless. So, so that people will keep you around because mm-hmm. a needy woman or a needy guy is, is unattractive. Yeah. I mean, according to what we've heard, right. Or what we've been taught. So <laughs> right. it's, it's, you become the cool chill girl, you know, who, uh, who has no needs and doesn't rock the boat. And, but what does that do? Right. I mean, it's, it's this kind of very primal thing that we, we do as humans, which is like, I think it's uh, Gabor Mate talks about how as as human beings, we have two greatest needs and it's um, authenticity and attachment or autonomy and attachment. Mm-hmm. And he says they're they're equal. And yet attachment will trump authenticity every time. Right. Because uh, mm-hmm. often, uh, attachment to us is life or death when we're babies. And so yeah. if it comes down to it and you're not aware of it and you're kind of acting out of your unconscious place, you're going to choose attachment. Even if that attachment's not healthy, it's just the security of having that, <laughs> that being there, right? That feels safer. Cause the attachment can definitely suck. It can yeah. suck. You know, and that's the like thing. Unhealthy. So many people I'm like, what is this giving you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> nothing. It's just a body. Well, it's giving them some fake sense of security or, totally. you know, some feelings of self-worth, right? Oh, look, mm-hmm. there is someone that wants to spend time with me, even though they're not really nice to me when they do spend time with me. Right. Yeah. It's so we are needy. We're needy. We're yeah. humans. Humans have needs. Needy is quote unquote normal. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, own it's... them, but don't let them own you. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, I think that's part of it. Going back to the beginning, what you were saying, that's part of that, that balance, right? How do we find that balance? I mean, so much of it is, um, okay, I have this need. How much of this is mine? How much can I own in this? Like, what do I need to do for myself? And then what is it that I actually ask for in a friendship or a partnership or whatever relationship, family, doesn't matter. Um, but I do think there's a little work that usually has to be done in the beginning, which is like how much of this is mine to own. Right. Um, because I do think that's what, what we've done. I've seen, I think as a society is like this idea of having needs. Um, we have started to champion this idea that needs are normal. Mm-hmm. We have needs, communicate your needs, but as most things go, we've swung the pendulum. And so now when I hear clients, even in sessions, it's like, everything's a need, everything. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's yeah. not actually, that's not a need that's on you. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I need them to text me when they get home and I need them to text me when they go here. I didn't no. That's your anxiety. What you need to do is start digging into why you think that's a need (laughs) and what that's doing for you and not actually put that on them. Right. And, and so that's the conversation we'll end up having in that example. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it it also could be a preference. I I like to hear from my partner at the end of the day, but do I need it to feel safe in the relationship? I don't know. Probably, probably not. Probably not. I'm going to say, well, and that's exactly right. It's a preference. It's but here's the thing. Okay. Let's just use that example of like, I need them to text me the minute, the minute they get home. Okay. So what is that quote unquote need serving, right? Like what's that doing for you? Let's talk about why you feel like you need it. So what's the fear? Usually there's some sort of fear or feeling of detachment that's coming up, right? Okay. So if they did that thing, 
how would that then make you feel, right? Okay, it would make me feel trusting. It would make me feel attached. It would make me feel connected to them. Okay, are there other ways in your relationship that you feel like you can get that need met outside of saying, I demand that you do this thing for me because it's a need? Because what's yeah. probably going to happen is, sure, you can communicate that in that way, but they're going to do it begrudgingly. And it's actually yeah. going to put a wedge between you versus actually giving you what yeah. you think you need, which is that connection and attachment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes people, uh, they sort of forget that they are getting some of their needs met, some of the core needs met in other ways. They just yes. don't recognize it. You know, he makes me a sandwich every time before I go to work. You know, like that's a way of showing love totally. that, and connection and caring. But he doesn't text me when he comes home. You know, it's like, well, look at all the other ways in which they are showing up for you. Negativity bias. We love to focus on the negative. Negativity bias. Mm-hmm. Another like very normal human trait. Yeah. Which is that we, we, we ignore all of the, the positive stuff and we look at just what's, what's not right. Yeah. It's a survival yeah, I mean, I mechanism, right? I mean, that's, that's how our species has survived is by scanning for danger. Right. And being able to, right. to pick out the negative, even when things are good. But unfortunately, because we're not running from tigers anymore, <laughs> that negativity bias tends to be very focused on things like he's not making me a sandwich, but he's, but he's, you know, he's making me a sandwich, but he's not texting me when he gets home. And so it's, it's a little bit <laughs> gone amok, I think. <laughs> and well, my, my, uh, my example might not work really well because like they're together in the morning, but not in the evening, you know, like how's that? He's, he's there to make a sandwich, but he's not there to text you. But I think people know what, what we're talking about. I think they, I think they get it. <laughs> there could be a relationship in which you, that happens, you know, I don't know. I mean, I've said I was an avoidant before, but I'll say it again. That'd probably be my ideal relationship, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you said you had avoidant tendency. I guess we could talk about that because I, I think I connected to that as well. I think I have avoidant tendencies as well. I'm, I'm less likely to bring it up if, if I think that things are, are fine, I'm. You know, it's going to take some friction for me to bring it up. Yeah. I'll bring up anything. That's for me anyway. It's going to take a lot of friction for me to bring up pretty much anything. I mean, I've gotten better, but <laughs> it, it, I, I, you know, I, I always say to people like, well, if I had, if you had asked me five, 10 years ago, I would say I never bring it up. And then maybe, you know, a couple of years ago, it was like, oh, it might take me two weeks to bring it up. And now maybe right. it'll take me a day or two to bring it up. So there's improvement. Yeah. <laughs> we are, we're getting better. Yeah. I, I know that my, uh, I, if I have been dating people that are more avoidant than me, then I will start to feel pretty anxious about the relationship. I feel like I hear that a lot. That's, I think that's really common. I think that's common. I, yeah. I don't know. Well, I'm trying to think of, I've actually ever dated anybody who's avoidant. I guess my ex maybe was a little bit more avoidant, but he also had a problem with alcohol. So I think he just numbed it all, but it for sure made me feel a little bit more anxious in the relationship. So yeah, I think that's, we just compensate. Is there an obsession around attachment theory? Culturally? Yes. These days. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yes. Well, look, I mean, we just, we want everything <laughs> to make sense. We want everything to fit into a neat, tidy little box and for there to be a reason for everything. Because if I can say, oh, it's because I have this have being the operative word, right? Check this box. Um, then I can fix it. I can solve it. I can blame it. I can whatever. That's just not how the human psyche works, right? All of this stuff is, is spectrum and there's pendulums and it's, it's just not that clear cut. And that's the frustrating, but also beautiful part of being a human is that we can't be put into boxes. Yeah. I also think, you know, people will say, Oh, I, I'm anxious. And so uh, then I'll understand it and I'll be able to fix it. But I feel like m most people aren't trying to fix anything. They're just going to say, oh, this is why I act this way. It's a justification. So now I need to find someone to justify it. Yeah. And I need to find someone who's going to be able to work with me with this. Totally. Not, not, oh, now I have the information. I can understand it and I can work towards solving or healing this part of me. Yes. I mean, there are some, some of those people and they're probably listening to this podcast and way to go. They're probably listening to your podcast also because they're self-aware and they're, you know, they're into personal growth and they want the relationships to be better. But I get a lot of questions saying like, well, I'm anxious and he's avoided it and I just don't see how this could ever work. But I mean, I would say if you're anxious, most likely nine out of 10 of the relationships you find yourself are going to be with an avoidant. So you better, you better <laughs> figure out how to make it work because this isn't the first time it's going to go. <laughs> I promise you that. <laughs> Like, That's great. I, I mean, I think people are just looking for easier, better 
you know, well, easier, easier, better, is a deeper. Good word. <clears throat> yeah, easier. Let, but it's going to require less work on my behalf. I mean, cool. Right. People can find that. I mean, I, I think there's people like that all over the place. And I don't think those are the people that are really like, I mean, listen, this is going to sound a little judgy, but I, I, I think that you can want easier. And I've jokingly said to friends of mine, like, God, remember when I didn't know anything about this? Like, remember when we didn't talk about this stuff and we didn't know anything about human development? And it was just like glorious to just like have our head in the sand and just be reactionary and not give a shit and like all the things, you know, because sometimes it is like that, um, like the, what, what is the term I'm thinking of? It's like the beauty of not knowing, right? I mean, it's just. Oh, ignorance is bliss. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. But I think that if you are really truly on this path of, of self-development and self-betterment, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm not saying it's easy, but there's a, a, there's a realization or maybe a, a, a begrudging acceptance that the heart is actually part of it. And the heart is, that's the juicy stuff. Like that's what you want. You want to be activated because it's in that activation that you get to understand and grow and learn more. doesn't mean it's comfortable and doesn't mean you want to be activated all the time, but right. I think there's a limit to totally to that. And, and also there are some people that are just not going to be good for you, right? If there's abuse of totally. any kind, then we're not staying no. for the juicy activation no. and the, the, God, the no. knowledge we might get after the fact, right? Yeah. No. And yet, and yet I will say, I mean, this is where my depth psychology comes into play. I mean, Jung would say that all of that is there for a reason, right? Like your, yeah. your unconscious drew that person into your sphere for a reason. There are lessons to be learned. Are you going to learn them in this life? Time. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be the next lifetime, but there's a purpose to that, right? Now, we're not saying stay, continue to stay in it. If you have the awareness and the, and the being ready to leave it, don't stay for the growth, right? But, yeah. but there is something to be said for why, you know? Why yeah. are you in this? And that's, that's something I think that I, I have conversations with people all the time. It's like, it's not to victim blame, but there's always a part. It's this idea of keeping your side of the street clean, right? It's, it's, the, it's the 12 step idea of like, what can I own? What's my hundred percent? You know, people say, oh, well, he was a narcissist. Okay. Well, why are you attracted to narcissists? Let's start there. <laughs> I don't like this line of questioning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, people get really uncomfortable with this, this kind of questioning because it, it forces you to sit in the hot seat, you know? Yeah. So what is it about people who are constantly attracted to, you know, uh, let's say narcissists, mm -hmm. right? Who find themselves over and over and over again in relationships with people who are not good for them. I mean, usually it's something, you know, there's a little bit of like repetition compulsion in that, yeah. which is, you know, your unconscious is just repeating the same patterns over and over and over again, attempting to solve it, attempting to understand it, attempting to fix it in some way. Um, and until you get the lesson, it's just going to keep happening. Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, many times that's what I find is going on with clients, but also in my own personal story, I've experienced that too. Uh, yeah. and I think that's the uncomfortable part. The uncomfortable part is like, okay, what's my part in this? Where, how am I showing up? Um, you know, what is it? And, and until you make that unconscious conscious, it's just going to keep happening. So I think it, it has yeah. to be looking in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah, we're not blaming. We're just saying, yeah. you know, maybe a little bit of introspection here as to why this keeps happening might be useful. Would 100% be useful. I'll be even <laughs> stronger with that language. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, so it's like, why am I, why am I attracted to, you know, the, the flighty, hippie sort of nomadic woman, right? Because mm. that, that's been sort of, that's been a, a pattern for me in my life. And it's because you know, uh, they are unlikely to settle down. Well, yeah, you're a little bit of an and avoidant. So, you just said that, right? So that's, sounds right. pretty so easy I don't, to I don't, you. <laughs> right. There's a fear of intimacy there that I, I don't ever have to really worry about fully committing to this person. I might even say, I'm ready to fully commit to you, knowing that they will not be able to fully commit to me. And so, you know, boom. Isn't that classic though? Something. Because then coming away from that scenario, your ego can go see. I've gone deeper. I tried and, and it just didn't, it's not me. <laughs> That's true. And that did happen. That did happen. Mm -hmm. I was like, look, I gave it a good old college try. It was really a showed up and you didn't. Mm -hmm. That's it's the thing. It, the ego has a me, really good you. way of keeping itself in the same <laughs> like story. You know, it's, it's crazy to think, but it, it's, it, do you know, it's actually harder for the ego 
to challenge the narrative that it's had about itself, even if that narrative is like shitty and constricting and whatever, I'm unlovable, I'm that, whatever that narrative is, it's actually easier for the ego to hold on to that narrative than it is to accept responsibility and, and grow and change through it, right? It's, it just is. <laughs> we want comfort, even if the comfort means I have to believe that I'm like a shitty person or whatever that is, you know? Yeah, or that I'm going to continue having relationships with people that are bad for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Also, totally. there's a bit of the devil you know. Oh, completely. I mean, that's the thing we a do, right? The... I like. I, I the smell is familiar. I, I know this. I'm used to this game. I know how to. I know how to play it. You know. Um, yeah. But again, there's. I no can play the victim. Growth. Yeah. Oh well, and victim is a very, very common kind of storyline or narrative that the the ego holds onto because it's a really good way to keep you from having to like look in the mirror, which is hard. Yeah. My friend used to say, um, <laughs> oh, God, this is gonna your be ego is not your amigo. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not your amigo, and yet it's still very important, right? Yeah. It's, uh, I like to say, like, Jack Kornfield always talks about, like, he calls it, like, your cast of characters. And he talks about, like, all the seats at the table. And your ego deserves a seat at the table. I mean, it's, it's very important, actually, but it doesn't deserve the head of the table, right? Yeah. Right. Don't destroy the ego. Don't also pay it as much attention as we might be. Yeah. Well, you can't. I mean, if you destroyed the ego, you would you would literally destroy yourself. It's like not possible, right? Um, and that's narcissism to a T. I mean, this is why as a therapist, most therapists say like narcissists are their least favorite clients because the, the thing about narcissists is that if you really truly, and I'm talking like not the fact that everybody's kind of narcissistic. I mean, that's just bottom line right. human nature, but somebody who yeah. truly registers like on the spectrum of narcissistic personality disorder, what's so difficult about them is that if they truly, truly have that ability to have insight and they have that moment of like, Oh my God, aha, if this is me, it's about me. Uh, there can be a psychotic break in that. Oh, uh, it's actually wow. risky. Because their development of self ha is so established on this kind of armored, it's not me, it's everybody else, that if there really truly is a moment of insight, it can actually dismantle their entire egoic sense, which can, can really lead to a, a kind of a psychotic break. Wow. Because at, at the center of narcissism is such a deep hole of feeling completely unlovable, unworthy. I mean, just like absolute, like a hole, I mean, a black hole. And so they develop this really actually kind of amazing, if you think about it, defensive shield around that in order to survive. And so if you get through that and you truly get to that hole, if they're not, if they don't have enough strong enough kind of ego sense, you, you, you can do some real damage. I'm blown away. Yeah. It's fascinating. Also a little so, sad, actually. Very sad. Narcissism is so sad and it's developed by the way. People aren't born narcissists. It's developed in childhood. It's very sad. Oh, yeah, I'm like actually feeling like teary as as you describe this this patient, and there are people like this that you know just have a black hole of mm -hmm. of unlovability. Yeah, and it's I mean it's you can you can feel empathy and sadness, and also still not justify the behavior, right? But can you yeah. hold the tension of the opposites? For a lot of us who have been in relationship with, regardless of what kind of relationship with a narcissist, it's it's a constant practice to hold the tension of that. Like I can feel empathy for you and be sad and see the child in you. Um, and also still be boundaried and not accept the, the bad behavior. Right. Yeah. I can love you and not want to be in a relationship with you. Totally. Yeah. I, I learned from Dr. Alexander Solomon about dialectics, you know, the mm -hmm. both and yeah. I, I love that, you know, like I really respect you. I really love you. And being in a relationship with you is not the right thing for me. Yeah. You know, can I hold both of those things together? I learned from, uh, Dr. Jay Talkoff, my, my therapist when I was 22 and, uh, we, a couple, we, I had a girlfriend and we started going to couples counseling. And then when I finally, finally got sober, I started experiencing all these different emotions. Mm. And at one point he said, you know, your ability to hold two competing emotions or multiple competing emotions at any one time about any one thing is a sign of emotional maturity. Yep. Totally. And I love that. I was like, yay, I'm, I'm emotionally mature. And he was like, well, it's a sign of emotional You're maturity. getting there. <laughs> Slow your roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can expect him to pump like, the brakes. 22-year-old John. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he pumped, yeah, he pumped the brakes. But I felt pretty good as a 22-year-old and starting to get, starting to understand that, you know? And well, I, I mean, that's actually really something 
we say is like a symptom of emotional health. Yeah. Symptom of emotional um, intelligence EQ is the ability to hold tension of the opposites. And it's also simultaneously one of the hardest things for human beings to do that and be okay with change. And yet it's, Ugh. it's the reality of our universe, right? That two things can exist or multiple things can exist simultaneously. And that change is a constant and go figure. They're two of the hardest things for humans to be able to tolerate, right? The universe yeah, is funny. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Oh God. I, I, yeah. Uh, how do I feel about change? I mean, it depends, right? If it's something that I don't like and I, I want it to change, I'll feel pretty good about it. <laughs> but when it's something that I like, you know, like a relationship with a woman that I'm in love with who might not be in love with me. And I don't want that to change for the worse, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll change is real hard for a lot of us. I mean, I would say for all of us just to, like you said, varying degrees. Yeah. I had a relationship end last year and I moved. Mm. And that was an insane amount of change, you know. Actually, I don't want to use the word insane. A bananas amount of change. I like bananas as an alternative. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, and yet you know, not everybody's like this, but I tend to. If I look back, kind of on my life story, I think when I've done change, I, I, I tend to do the like drop the grenade, change everything at once. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know what that is. I don't. I mean, I'm sure I could probably go into childhood and think about what that looks like and why that's that. But it's like, if I'm going to change, I'm going to just like fucking clear the table, you know, one hand swipe. And, uh, and then I'm like, all right, this is good. (laughs) I can do this. (laughs) I mean, every time something, you know, quote unquote bad or uncomfortable has happened to me in hindsight, it's always led to some positive effects. Almost always. It usually takes some time. Yeah. Hindsight. hindsight. Hindsight's always 2020, right? And that's the tough. I mean, that's the, you know, in depth psychology, we were talking about it as being like the liminal space, right? It's like the, when you're, you're no longer who you were, but you're not yet who you will be. It's the most uncomfortable time, right? It's the between the change. <sighs> that's actually the hardest time for the human to tolerate, right? It's not the blow up, you know, as we would call like the death the kind of underworld and the rebirth. It's like, it's not the death usually. And it's not the rebirth. Usually it's usually the underworld. That's the hardest to tolerate. You know, you're like either hurry up and get there, or I want that to be the way that it used to be. And so we have this hard time kind of riding that, you know, middle. It's not the blow up and it's not the glow up. Yeah. It's the... I'll use that. I'm sure my depth psychology <laughs> colleagues are going to be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> that's the new phrase, blow up and glow up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm in the, I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle space right now, and it's fairly uncomfortable. Yeah, it is. It's real sad. I'm romanticizing the past. I'm you know looking into the future, and I'm like not super happy with the present. Yeah. Well, and that's I and think also, that's where we go. We 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 go to one of those places so we don't have to sit in what we're in. Yeah. And I sit. And I also sit in the present. Right. I hold those multiple competing emotions of being really dissatisfied with parts of my life right now. And also like enjoying the, the good things that I have that that moving has brought me or, you know, that leaving that relationship has brought me. That's all you can do. Trying to be emotionally. That's it. Yeah. Um, so switching gears a little bit here, uh, I get questions a lot on Instagram. You, you do too. Do the Q and a, I get a lot of this happened. How should I feel about it? Hmm. Which to me, I'm just like, what yeah. is going on? You know, like feel however you want to feel, feel mad, feel sad, feel happy, feel devastated. But it seems like people are like, just, they just don't know how to feel and they want others to tell them how to feel. So have we lost our connection to feeling or do we just want to be right, you know, be like quote unquote normal and feel how society wants us to feel? Both. Yes. And, (laughs) um, I think that, you know, I was saying earlier about like the happy, mad, glad, sad. I think that I, you know, I lead retreats and one of the, so whether it's a weekend retreat or whether it's a full week, um, I devote an entire two hour workshop series to the feelings wheel. (laughs) 
So yeah, I love the feeling as well. Yeah, I mean, it's and, but it's so fascinating to see how many of us. I mean, myself included, right? Like we are not raised with emotional vernacular. We're 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 just not, and it's generationally passed down, right? And and I think that we were as beings at some point, as human beings, we were at some point. I think that as we started to industrialize, as we started to um, turn more towards capital, as you know capitalism, all these things that intrinsically create suffering um, in beings and kind of this desire to like stuff things down for the sake of productivity, um, you know, lean more into masculine versus feminine, which is where that felt sense tends to live. We have lost touch with it. You know, I don't think we've, we've I, lost touch. I think that's all, I'll leave it there. And um, I think so much growth can happen when we actually do what kind of can feel a little bit elementary, the work around you know, the feelings wheel. I mean, you can, anybody who's listening, you can Google a million versions of them, right? Like I have one that I love in particular. When I first started doing therapy, I used to keep a, a picture of it in my saved album on my phone. Um, and what I tell clients too, it's like when you're feeling anything, at least something big enough for you to register, oh, I'm having a feeling. Can you pull it out and see if you can trace down below the happy, mad, glad, sad exterior and really get familiar with what is that actually. And you might not know, and that's okay. Um, you know, it might be worth writing a few sentences about it. You know, even if it's in your phone, it doesn't have to be like a full on journal practice, but what is going on? What does that feel like? I like to go also like, what's the, what's the physical sensation in my body? Oh, there's heat, there's tightness, there's fluttering, there's whatever, get really clear about the sensations. And sometimes that'll also help you like back into the emotion itself. But it's like learning a foreign language. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes practice. Yeah. It takes commitment. Um, but on the other side of it, it's, it's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit your relationships. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the feelings wheel. <laughs> I mean, I start every workshop with the feelings wheel, every session of every workshop with the feelings wheel, asking people, how are they feeling? How are they coming into the session in this yeah. very moment? You know? Yeah. And then it's, it's amazing because then you have, like you said, the vernacular, you have a more expansive emotional landscape, or maybe it's not more expansive, but your ability to describe it is more expansive. And I remember growing up, uh, I could, I only had like, I only went like zero to a hundred mm -hmm. in anger, mm -hmm. right? It was like, f I'm fine and blind rage. Yeah. There was nothing in between. And then over the years, I've been able to like sort of develop a sensitivity, right? And more, more, and more in touch with the internal landscape of what's going on emotionally. And then also with the feelings wheel, being able to like put a word to it. And yeah. then when I have the word, I can be like, oh, why? You know, yes, why do then I you could do the way? further could, exploration. That's the next step. It's like, oh, it's because, you know, X, Y, and Z, or this person said this, or I'm not getting this for whatever reason. Um, well, and I think you bring up a really good point too, which is, I mean, let's just talk about the fact that you're a male, right? And in, in our society, men are basically raised to emote, to feel in two ways, through anger and through sex. There's only mm -hmm. two ways that you've been told that you're allowed to feel anything, right? If it's expressed through yeah. anger, if it's expressed through fucking something. And so what about uh, tailgating, uh, sport, sporting events? Yeah. Well, I mean, sure. I guess that's feeling, but it's fun. <laughs> but is that like a depth of feeling? I don't know. <laughs> I like tailgating too. Uh, bliss, but... <laughs> bliss and joy. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We can feel happy, you know, like the good emotions are, are kind of on the table for all of us. Right. But as far as like, okay, the hard okay, okay. I see emotions, yeah. those are, that's what you've, you've been given, right? These are your options. And so you have uh, a lot of men. This is why we have all this anger and depression in men, right? I mean, depression is such a symptom of, of a life not lived, of feelings not felt. And so we have a, a landscape of depressed men because they've just been taught since birth to oppress, suppress everything. Um, and we also and have oppress. a, and oppress, right? And a landscape <laughs> of men who have sex to feel. Yeah. Right. And so what does that look like? I mean, shit, this is a whole other tangent we could go into. What does that look like in romantic partnership? Obviously, you know, I'm only going to be able to speak from a heteronormative perspective, but what that looks like is now we have men who use their women to feel women yeah. who know on a felt sense that they're being used for their partner to feel and thus get resentful and start to turn away from having sex. And then we get this whole dynamic of like, oh, my, my woman's frigid. All well, right. is she, or is she just sick of being your masturbation tool? Wow. Holy shit. Yeah. 
This is an area that I'm like very in right now. I'm like exploring it with my with my co-host um, Danae on my podcast. It's like such a holy shit phenomenon with men, and really the reason why it's so aha is because we've been seeing it show up so often in couples, and we're going, oh, this is part of what this is. Men have been taught they can't feel unless they're having sex, and so of course we all want to feel. We all have a depth of emotion to us. So I need a release valve. Well, what's my release valve? My woman. Wow. And there's, there's probably also, uh, you know, similarly women that are going to want to have more sex with their partner because that's the only time they feel close to them. Right. Because that's the only time that they're emoting or opening right. up to them is in the safety of the bedroom. Right. Which eventually is going to lead to not wanting to have sex. Period. Right. Okay. For the woman. Because if I, if I, yeah. whether I'm conscious of it or not, if I feel like that's the only time that I can connect my partner, what's going to, I'm going to end up feeling not safe in the 95% of the rest of the relationship or unsatisfied, right? Or disconnected. Yeah. What's the solution? Whew. That's a big one. I mean, <laughs> smash the patriarchy. Give every I mean, man. Really, it's, Get, what is it? Smash the Therapy. patriarchy. <laughs> Oh yeah. And I mean, the solution. Every man a feelings wheel. <laughs> yeah, the solution is is teaching our boys that they're allowed to feel all the feelings, right? The the solution yeah. is educating our children on on the depth of emotion and the range of emotion that we have as humans, and allowing all of the allowing for all of it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a big one. Little boys and girls. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. My little I girl. Know. I'll tell you, she's two and a half, and it's funny because I was talking to. Um, my therapist actually the other day and I said, she's got this tendency now where she'll, she, I mean, even at two and a half, she knows exactly what to say, how to push my buttons, what to do. I mean, she knows it to a T and the second she senses any kind of like bristling, she looks at me with these wide eyes and this big smile and she goes, are you mad, mommy? Are you mad? <laughs> she oh. fucking loves it. She eats it up. Are you mad? <laughs> Oh, that's like, so cute. I'm like, who sent you? Like, who sent you here? Because there's <laughs> such little mirrors, you know? And so she's learning these different words. Like, I'll say, no, I'm not mad. I'm frustrated. Or no, I'm not mad. I'm annoyed. Or I'm, you know, I'm feeling yeah. out of control. Or whatever the thing is that I'm struggling with in that moment. And um, so she's starting to use those words too. But she, like, she loves to see me in emotion. Even if that emotion is like, you know, a, a quote unquote negative emotion. Are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> you're such a little ass. That's the cutest thing ever. <laughs> it's cute, but when you're in the moment, <laughs> you're like, it's yes, cute I'm for pissed. me. It's in, in in hindsight, it's cute. Yeah, yeah. But she, that's another lesson too. I've I've taught her because then she'll say, "Are you happy?" Pretty soon after, and so I'm. It's an opportunity to say to her, "Well, as you see, though, you can be both happy and frustrated at the same time." And I'll have those conversations with her. Like she'll get mad at somebody for taking something from her, you know. And I say, "Oh, are you frustrated?" Yes. Do you love your friend? Yes. Okay. Do you see that? Like you can feel love and feel mad at somebody or frustrated with somebody at the same time. Oof. I know. This is so precious. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm tearing up about this. This <laughs> sad narcissist hole and therapist talking to her daughter about emotions and, <laughs> you know, dialectics. They're very precious. I like this. <laughs> see, look at this. Look at all this EQ that you're em emoting right now. All this ability. It's not zero to a hundred anymore, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I guess that is, that is a good example of like, I'm able to tear up like regularly. Recognize Just it. Yeah. Mi like mildly. It's, I'm not like, you know, no. I don't need a break. It's you know? feeling it's, it's, it's feeling alive is what that is. That's the sense of feeling alive. Yeah. I like it. It's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. My girlfriend likes it too. She's like, it's very sweet. You like tear up in weird moments, you know, and then you tell me why and, or you tell me what's coming up for you. You know, that's, a, that's something that I will ask someone if they're feeling emotional or it looks like they're about to cry and they don't know what to do. I'll say, what's coming up for you? Mm -hmm. Cause I don't know what's coming. You know, I don't know what's coming up for you. Yeah. And then they'll tell me and then I'll know more about them. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a beautiful moment of, of witnessing somebody being alive is what that is. That's what it feels like to me. Being you know? a human. Yeah. Do you know that even robots have needs? Not just humans. Okay. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, cause people were like, well, you know, humans have needs. We're not robots, but even robots have needs. You know, they, they need power. They need lube. They need a job, you know? So even robots have needs. <laughs> I'll let you, I'll let you have that. All one. right. I like that one. All right. Let's segue to Q and A. This is my transition. <laughs> <laughs> let's see what we got. 
Um, why are people scared of having hard conversations or of asking for what they want? Severed That's attachment. That's actually my question. Severed attachment. Huh? Severed attachment. Severed attachment. It all comes down What's to that? that, like attachment versus autonomy or authenticity. You know, we've been attachment. If we if we think about attachment in its like simplest, I mean, not that it's simple, but in its simplest form, attachment equals survival, right? So when you're a baby, right. you learn very quickly what to do and not do, how to act, what to say, whatever, in order to maintain attachment with your caregivers. That's the first right. kind of development of like inauthenticity really, um, in order to keep that attachment. And so we, we keep that, those behaviors as we get older, um, and they show up later in life. And, and so what happens is we think again, like attachment is the, the end all be all not really realizing at this stage in our life, like you're not going to die. Like you would, if you were an infant, <laughs> you would actually die. Right. But now at like 38 years old, like if my attachment, my figure right now, you know, my partner left, would I be devastated? Of course, but I'm not going to actually die. Right. But at a deep, existential level, there is a real true sense that that feeling, we call it annihilation anxiety. I mean, there is a real feeling of, I will die. I will be annihilated if I, if I have severed attachment. And so we learn a lot of behaviors that are very skilled behaviors to keep that attachment. So we don't risk that severing. Yeah. Wow. This, I mean, makes so much sense. I, therapists make a lot of sense. You've, lear- you you've learned a lot of stuff where, where it makes it ends up making a lot of sense. Um, it, it's funny. I, t- I teach people this idea that you're not going to die. And then of course there's always some the, that's like, well, some people have re- rejection sensitivity disorder and technically they could die. And I'm like, okay, fine. And they're like, well, they can also kill themselves. And they go, okay, yeah, you're right. Okay. So, you know, some ca- caveats there, but for the most part, if you ask your partner for more sex, they say, no, you're not going to die. Or if they leave you because you at, so we're scared of asking because if we ask, they might leave. Yes. Right. We yeah. rock the boat or we ask for something that they don't want. And so they leave. And so rather than having to face that, we just don't ask. Which is codependency at the, at the core of codependency is a fear of abandonment and rejection. Right. So I'm going to allow my fear of abandonment or rejection to, to control how I'm going to show up in this relationship because it's all about manipulating the environment and manipulating the relationship in order to maintain an attachment. It's all manipulation. Again, it's not that it has a negative motive. We get why the motives there, it makes sense, but it's still manipulatory behavior. Wow. (laughs) I'm just thinking of all the times in which I've done this. Oh my God, are you kidding? I'm so manipulative, (laughs) it's not even funny. and, And probably I'm continuing to do it. Yeah. We do it every day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Another question. Um, You have to bear with me. If you're listening to this, bear with me Um, because I'm looking for the, I'm looking for the gold, you know, look for the gold. I like it. What? So, okay. So what's this idea of, um, so the, the question is how do you date honestly and intentionally without being called intimidating? Right. But this is, probably coming from a woman Uh who feels that uh, men find her too intimidating. Well, I would say those are not your men. (laughs) First and foremost, um, Um, the people that believe you're too much are not your people. Keep it moving, especially as a woman. Um, and as somebody who's been called too much many times in my life, um, I will say that too much the fear of being too much and the fear of being not enough are two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would examine why there seems to be based on the way this question is written, a pattern of bringing people into your sphere that believe that you're intimidating. There might be something around, this is shadow work to me. I mean, there's, there's some work to be done around what intimidating means to you what being intimidating means to you. What's the fear of, of being intimidating? Is there disgust to the feeling of being intimidating? Um, in general, I would say there's some deep unconscious work to do around what intimidation means to you as a woman. And look, part of it is just like, you'll be ostracized from society, right? We've been told as women that we can't, we shouldn't be right. It's the bitch. It's right. the, all these yeah. words that we have for that kind of woman, which we don't have the equivalent words for that kind of man. Right. Yeah. Um, but, just man. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> successful, 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 man. Mm-hmm. Right. 
So I would just say so they're up. not your people. It's really just that simple to me. Yeah, that that's I think also the fear, you know, it, you were saying like is there disgust? The fear is is could also be that I'll never find someone to love me because everyone's going to find me intimidating and so now I have to make myself smaller or less me to please another person. Yep. Codependency. Yep. And also too, I mean, look, I will say there's a caveat to this, which is depending on, I don't know this person's story, but depending on how she was prior to maybe where she's at now. And if she's listening to your podcast and writing in questions, like we were saying, she's, she's probably on this journey too. I don't know what she looked like or showed up as prior to this. What I will say is it's a very normal human thing for when we start to do any kind of self betterment work, we tend to swing on the pendulum. So mm. like, for example, with boundaries, a lot of people who don't know how to set boundaries, when they first start experimenting with boundaries, they come across as like, bam, 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 in your face, walls, no, walls, no. walls. Um, that's normal. It's not great. I mean, it's, we don't love it, but it's normal. And, and that's just really the psyche's way of being like, oh, I don't like this side. That doesn't feel good. Let me swing over here. Oh, that also doesn't feel great. <laughs> so now let me find Let's the middle. Find middle point. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's where she's at. Maybe she is being a little aggressive. I don't know. Maybe that's just like, you know, in response to somebody who didn't have any aggressiveness in her before, you know, and and that's fair too. That is true though. When I, when I learned boundaries, I was a pain in the ass, you know, I was a no to everything and really rigid. And, you know, my brother was like, dude, you need to cool it a little bit. You know, like (laughs) you used to be the cool guy and now you're the not cool guy. You know, can we find something in the middle middle ground? (laughs) Totally. Okay. This one's interesting. Uh, so I get this question, some variety of this question really often, which is, um, is my boyfriend liking hot women on Instagram just a harmless kink? Should I ask him? Or like, you know, a variation of this is that like, I don't like that my boyfriend likes and follows hot Instagram people. What do I do about it? This is a really hard question for me because I am like the least jealous human on this planet, like almost to a pathological (laughs) point. And I have like my own work to do around that. Um, I, so I'm, I'm, I always try really hard to answer questions about any kind of jealousy from a place of like, what would the middle be? (laughs) Yeah. Um, well, how, okay. Answer it the way you would answer it. Ask, talk to them about it. Like that's a, that's a definite, right. And she said like, should I say it? Yeah. You always. If you're ever asking, should I say it? The answer is almost always yes, say it. Um, <laughs> but I would say, come in with what's your part? Because it's not oh. about you're doing this thing. I don't like you're doing this thing. What is it for you? That's what you come into the conversation with. Right. It makes right. me feel like yeah. I'm not desired by you. It makes me feel, you know, insecure. insecure. Anxious, and now, And now we go back not- to what's yours to own. How much of those needs are for yeah. you to take care of, right? Because it's not yeah. actually your partner's responsibility to make sure you don't feel insecure. That's actually on you, right? Your partner is the cherry on the yeah. Sunday. They're not the Sunday. You're the Sunday. So right. you got to yeah. figure out what your work is around feeling insecure. And then your partner can help add to that or help color that for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is why these kind of things should be conversational. It shouldn't be a fight. This isn't a fight. This is actually a, a great opportunity for you to be vulnerable and bring this conversation to your partner and say, wow, all these things are coming up for me. Can, can you help me explore it? Let's be curious about it together. Right. And hopefully you have a partner that can also be curious about it with you because it provides a wonderful stage for you to learn more about yourself and how you are in relationship. Um, rather than this person is doing something wrong. I need to shut it down. Yeah. So two things, one is also a beautiful opportunity to get curious about what he's getting out of it. Totally. What, what do you get out of this? Oh, it's like, it's just, I like looking at hot chicks on the internet. Yeah. Like, okay, cool. That's like, it's pretty much like looking at porn, right? Like it's Which soft core Instagram I have no porn. problem with. Again, it's like, this is hard for me to find that middle ground because even <laughs> right, as a partner, right. I'm like, so I have no problem with my partner looking at porn. Like I, to me, that's not a, it's like a non-issue, which a lot of women don't agree with. And that's cool. I'm not here to convince anybody. Yeah. So, but it's tough for me. Cause I'm like, most of the time I'm like, and <laughs> I don't know. So what's the big deal? Yeah. Kind of. I mean, <laughs> unless it's a big deal, right? Unless it turns into like obsession. But if it's like kind of the, the normal, I don't know, whatever, we could go into a whole tangent on that. <laughs> no, no, that, this is good. So that was the first thing, right? Is, yep. is that, you know, what, what do they get out of it? And then the, the second thing is, I forgot what the second thing well, is. What's, what's coming up for you? Porn. What's coming up for you? That's what's the coming up? thing. What insecurities yeah, okay. is it bringing up That's... for you, right? Yeah, but I had another thing. I had oh, a third damn. thing. 
It'll come to you. <laughs> the second we start talking about something else, it'll come to you. Uh, it will. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good. Yeah. Good job. Let's see. Let's see. How do I feel about, yeah, I think I follow like some like hippie, you know, like polarity coaches and like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Same. And I, and I, you too. Mm-hmm. Hippie polarity. Coaches? <laughs> it's a genre, isn't it? On Instagram. There's a hashtag. Yeah, it is definitely hippie polarity. Coaches. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Well, John Wyland fans. Of course. <laughs> Obviously, I would, I would love to Who's go to one this? of his workshops, but they're freaking seven thousand dollars for like a three day workshop. And I'm like, yo, dude, come I on. Know. <laughs> hey, you know he's got a Malibu property, so of course he does. His expensive. workshops are seven thousand dollars. A... <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's to pay for the property, not the other way around. Yeah, well, I, w- I wish someday. <laughs> Who's the female equivalent of uh, John Wyland? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I I don't know. And you know what? I wish there was one because I think so much of this conversation, we also need to hear it from the woman's side. You know, there's a lot of this, like the David Ditas and the John, you know, John Wineland Wineland was a student of David Ditas um, that I love and appreciate. And I'm so glad that they exist and that they're bringing the conversation to men. But also, I don't think we hear a lot of this from the woman's perspective, maybe like an Esther Perel, but she's still very clinical. So she's got that kind of clinical arm. But I don't know that there's really anybody who's out there that is like at that level of those guys, to be honest, from the woman. Right. Well, if anybody's listening, send us, uh, send us a message and, you know, I think Danae wants to be my best friend. She would love to be that. She's really championing the story. So maybe she'll be that someday. (laughs) Okay. Perfect. So we'll, we'll, we'll all get behind Danae then. Get behind Danae. (laughs) Um, let's see. Okay. This is great. This is, you're going to love these ones. Um, he pulled back efforts after sex. Why do I feel used? Should I wait to be exclusive now? Well, partly you feel used because there was a sense of being used. And yeah. I'm not saying that he did it maliciously or maybe even consciously, right? We're not saying this right. person's an asshole. That's not what we're saying, but you feel used because you were used. And I think this goes back a little bit to what we were saying. And I, I get it. This is a very like heady conversation that we could go down, but and one that a lot of men are not willing to hear. And I get it. Mm. It's just not the culture that we live in, um, which is there's a bit of, a, of a, I need to use this person to, to feel, to get off, right? To have this release. Mm. Should I wait to be exclusive? Yes. I mean, 100%. Can you have a conversation with this person about it? Because if you don't feel safe enough to have a conversation about this, then this is not the person to be exclusive with. Because it's actually not about the behavior itself, really. It's about, do you feel safe enough to talk to him about this behavior? If you don't feel safe enough to have this kind of conversation with somebody, then I don't know that this is the person that you want to be in an intimate relationship with. Now, also, that could be on you. I don't know. You have to explore your resistance to having that conversation. But I, I feel like... How do I articulate this? It's like we are so much more scared to have the uncomfortable conversation than just attaching. Yeah. Right? Um, talk to them about it. It's like always my response. Talk, 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 talk. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag talk about it. A coach and a therapist do an episode and most of the tools are, have you tried talking about it? Wait, is this a question that you just read? No, no, no. no oh my no, God. No. I was like, that's amazing. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bumper, like, that's uh, like the line of the episode. My, my experience with uh, losing interest or like, you know, showing less effort in uh, like a sexual relationship is that sometimes, quite often, especially when I was younger, attraction would drive the interest. Totally. And the desire. And the effort. And then when we had sex, it was gone. The desire was gone. And this happens to women as well. I mean, I I made a post about it and all these women were like, yeah, me too. You think that only happens to men? No, that happens to us too. We want to have sex. We were horny. Mm -hmm. It's driving the connection. Mm -hmm. And then once we come or once we have sex, it's gone. It's just not there anymore because there aren't other points of connection. Like exactly. I mean, this is the, this is the trouble of, of, basing a relationship on chemistry alone, right? On physical chemistry alone. I mean, such a tiny part of a, of a relationship, tiny, I get it. It's important, but it's also talking to somebody and feeling safe is important. Who's to say one's more important than the other. It's like, you got to look at it. I I think um, my partner, John always talks about it like the legs of a table. 
you can't uh, take away yeah. one leg. The table will fall over, period, right? It's yeah. like they're all equally important. And if you put weight on just that, then inevitably that table is going to fall over at some point. I, I actually yeah. just had this conversation with him yesterday when I was talking about physical appearance. And I was saying, um, I appreciate, he's a words of affirmation guy. And I'm like, I appreciate the words around my physical looks, you know, like, oh, you look so hot today. Or, oh, I love your ass and those pants, like whatever comes up for him. I'm like, yeah. and there's a fear for me there, which is that's not going to last forever. Yeah. What else do you want to compliment me on? I, I would actually appreciate hearing other things like, you know, yeah. the way that I handled that thing or, or the way that I, you know, took charge of this or whatever. Um, because while it feels good to know that my partner thinks I'm hot, it also, there's a thing in the back of my mind that says it's not going to always be that way. It, well, as long as you keep going to CrossFit for as long as possible. As long as my knees hold out. Yeah. Let's see, let's see how long. <laughs> as long as your knees. <laughs> we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> knees and low back. You'll be fine. I mean, look, he's almost 50. He's still doing it every day. So it's the best shave of his life. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what he says. We can't all be like John Kim. <laughs> We can't all be like John Kidd. No, we can try. <laughs> um, all right, Vanessa, where... Okay, tell us about the book a little bit and then where we can find you and where we can work with you. Yeah, so the book is called It's Not Me, It's You, a relationship book that I wrote with my partner, both therapists, obviously. And um, you know, it's, it's part memoir, part self-betterment. So we're very cool. candid. We're very honest about our struggles as partners, um, You know, the different things that we, we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis, like the large stuff, but also the small stuff. And it translates into what we see working with couples. And so that's the yeah. kind of correlation or the connection there. Uh, it's going to go wide in September. It's on pre-order now and very excited about it. Um, and then you can connect with me at my Instagram. I'm on Instagram more than TikTok. So Instagram is Vanessa S. Bennett for now. I don't know. Someday I'll change that. Who the hell is Vanessa Bennett? I know. Who has the Vanessa Bennett? Everybody. Also, uh, my old, my last name used to be Smith a long time ago. And so I have the S in there and I'm like, ugh, I just want it gone. But anyway, Vanessa S. Bennett for now. Um, on TikTok, I'm the Coda Yoda. So I drop, oh, a, lot, cool. drop a lot of Coda That's good. Knowledge. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then website, Vanessa Bennett.com. So I offer a lot of, a lot of fun stuff there. I'm excited about the book. I think it's going to be really fantastic. I think it's, it's really fun to have a book that's not all self-help that has part memoir. It just makes it so much easier to read. I'm a little burnt out on, on just straight self-help books. Yeah, I agree. And I, I do think that a lot of what you've seen in the social media sphere, not all of it, but some of what you've seen in the social media, like self betterment kind of sphere, like why it's exploded so much is because it's been an opportunity for a lot of self-help people, therapists, coaches, whatever, to kind of pull the curtain back on themselves and be honest and vulnerable about their humanness. And as therapists, we're taught hardcore against that, right? We are taught to be yeah. blank slates, right? That's that kind of old way, old Freudian way of showing up. Yeah. It's just not how humans connect. It's not how humans heal, period. Hard stop. Like we heal in connection with others, right? And so I think so much of what John and I do as therapists is buck against that system of I need to be a blank slate. Um, and people find solace in going, oh, you're, you don't have your shit together because you're a therapist. Like I see the, the struggle. Um, and so I, I see you as a human and now I can trust you more, you know? Oh, cool. Oh, well, I'm pumped to read it. I think there's one coming my way. Um, I, I really liked reading Lori Gottlieb's, uh, maybe you should talk yeah, to same. someone because that, that sort of did like a really good job of peeling the curtain back. Um, do you struggle with peeling it back a little too much or like ha having to keep parts of your life? Private? Yeah. Like what's the balance? I mean, I think that's, that's constantly a struggle for me. I, John is way more of an open book than I am. And there has to be times where I'm like, mm, no, nope, delete that. You're not posting that. We're not talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think he's just, and he's also been doing this for so much longer than me. He's been documenting his life for so long that it's just, yeah. it's like all he knows. And so I think I tend to be a little bit more boundary than that, but I am very honest about my relationship struggles. I, I do not hold back. I just, I feel like it's a service to the world to have somebody be honest about it and then be able to articulate some of the struggle, um, from kind of more of that, like analytical perspective and just like soul perspective, to be honest, I think we just need more of that. Yeah. Cool. I've been, I've been pulling back, you know, and not sharing much, much, not a lot about my private life <clears throat> or my relationship or my relationship status, just because it doesn't, it feels a little weird and doesn't feel as safe as it used to when I only had like 2000 followers, you know? Well, I also think you have to do what feels safe for you, right? Like I, there, there are, John and I have rules around like what we post about Logan, what we don't post about Logan, what we post about us, you know? And, um, 
we, we stick to those rules. And I've learned that from a couple other friends of ours that are in the social media world. Like you, you have to be safe and you have to do what feels right and true to you. And that's going to look different for everybody. So you just got to like follow your gut, you know? Yeah. All right. Final question. You ready? Yeah, go. What does love mean to you? Wow. You know, it's funny. I, without even trying to think about it, I was just like letting whatever came up, came, come up. And I, I feel like, um, this is definitely like some childhood answer that just came up, which was like safety. Yeah. That was the first word that came up with safety. I mean, I think it means more than just that, but that was the first word for sure. Yeah. That, I mean, those are the answers I'm looking for. Yeah. Safety. I was being seen. I think those are two of the ones that came up. Yeah. And I, I was like secretly hoping that you would say codependency. <laughs> what does love mean to you? <laughs> Codependent is shit. Codependency. <laughs> uh, Vanessa, thank you so much for your time. It's, uh, it was so great to chat with you and thank you for your wisdom as well. Yeah. Thank you, Sean, for having me. I appreciate it.